Okay, welcome to the class. This is going to be a video recording, considering that this is uh, Halloween week, and I don't suppose that uh, you all want to be spending Halloween evening inside of lecture, so we will do a entirely video recorded lecture. So in this lecture, I want to introduce the new lab that we're going to explore. We're going to move on to the shell lab where we're going to write our own Unix shell. And so I'm going to spend this lecture to really kind of motivate and preface the idea on how we're going to uh, to do this. Oh, excuse me just a moment. Roger, heck, got them all plugged. Okay. So... This is, I think, one of the most quintessential labs that we'll cover uh, over the semester, and it'll probably be, um, we'll probably go over a couple semesters of, of working through it and kind of defining it. And of course, this lab, like the other labs, is going to be group-based, team-based. So try to work in groups, talk about issues you might have. We'll talk more about that in the upcoming slides. Okay, so let's just do an introduction to our shell lab. So the purposes of this assignment is for you to gain a hands-on understanding of how Unix shells function and also to implement a basic shell program, which we'll call TSH, TISH, um, just effectively meaning tiny shell in C that can execute commands, handle process control, and manage jobs. So as opposed to boring you with the contents of the book, I'm going to depend on you to read the book to facilitate your ability to go ahead and do this lab and we'll kind of walk through this lab in, in our lecture time. So the big key concepts that are gonna be important that we're gonna cover that are again in the book, but we'll kind of briefly discuss in the slides that you'll need to know to be effective at this lab, the shell lab are gonna be processes. So processes are um, an instance of a program in execution. It's the basic unit of computation in our Unix environment. Of course, the purpose of a process is it allows us to separate the execution of different programs and provide a concurrent execution. Uh, other key concepts, the concept of forking or a fork. So a system call is, uh, the fork system call is used to create a new process which is then called a child process that runs concurrently with the process that made the fork, which we will then call the parent process. So an example of how we might make a fork is we can make a system call fork, and that's gonna create a uh, process. It's gonna return to us a process ID. Uh, and so the importance of forking is it's going to be critical for creating new processes in a shell. And so this is, this is a concept that's really gonna be what this, uh, this lab targets. So let's move on to the concept of these parent and child processes. The relationship here is that when we have a new process, it's created with fork. The original process is the parent, the new process is the child. And then you have the ability to communicate. Typically a parent and child can communicate through pipes and signals. So signaling, we'll define that as a way to deliver asynchronous notifications to a process in order to evoke event-driven actions right? Because we don't know how long ahead of time the child processes are going to take to run. So there needs to be a way to update the parent process to know, oh, I'm done working. And then these are just some common signals. We have the aliases here and we'll cover them more as we go deeper into the slide deck. Uh, and then we have how we might use these signals is in the, the kill method or a function that we're looking at here where you can pass a process ID and a particular type of signal. And this particular signal will then send an interrupt signal and actually kill that particular process. And then you have IO redirection, which is another important concept. This allows us to alter the standard input output flow of our program. Of course, the purpose of this is allows a program to read input from a file or send output to a file. Um, uh, instead of to the terminal. And so these are very useful for taking what would normally be uh, terminal display messages or um, input that you're you're pulling through from your keyboard and redirecting it to an input to an input file or an output file so that you can use it to diff against or you can use it to go and automate the task of providing an input into your application. Of course, we're gonna be writing our uh, shell code inside of the C programming language. And of course, uh, the C language is pretty much embraced at system level programming due to its close to hardware abstraction and our ability to have both that high level 
uh, capability of modeling and then that ability to drop into that uh, that lower level uh, uh, methodology of building our um, our assembly code or how we could uh, reverse engineer and see how our assembly code can then uh, effectively get uh, uh, compiled down into. And then our code structure is so you'll be writing the C functions that handle very shell functionalities, but you're going to be giving boilerplate code. And we're going to take a look at what that boilerplate code is in just a moment. So in terms of sections for reference, in this particular slide deck, uh, section three is going to provide some more background information on how shells work and what they do and the common shell functionalities that you're going to be concerned about. And then section four, we'll talk about the details of the specific texts to be implemented in the lab assignment, including being able to parse our commands, create processes, and implement job controls. Now, you're going to have some helper functions that are going to be pre-implemented for you. There's going to be some stub functions that you're going to have to go ahead and implement throughout the lab. And it's my intent to go ahead and do kind of a walkthrough of this process so you have some kind of guide to follow along. So in terms of the logistics, of the shell lab. As I stated earlier, we're going to do a collaborative approach. And so um, what that's really going to mean is this is going to be a collaborative project where I want the students to work in groups of your own making uh, to encourage collaboration and to allow you to collectively problem solve on these issues so you're not stuck having to figure out all on your own. And so despite the collaborative nature that I really want you to abide by, I also feel that it's each of your responsibilities to understand the entire project. So as you work in a group, I don't want one person to carry or just share code. You should have group discussions to ensure that each member is capable of explaining and implementing every part of the shell. Uh, that way everyone comes away with the same sets of knowledges. Now, one of the most critical tools for this project is going to be your textbook that you have, um, uh, Computer Systems, A Programmer's Perspective. So definitely use that book. In fact, uh, you might have to look up in certain chapters of that book, which I'll go ahead and give you reference to in a moment on how to actually solve these. The book examples will actually show you how to solve some of these problems in addition to what we'll cover in some of these slide decks. And so when you do use the book, which everyone should do, go ahead and cite where in the book when you find your solution, you have sourced it from. And then in terms of submissions, we'll cover this a little bit more in detail in the future, but I'll just iterate that even though this is a group project, each student has to submit their own work, their, their own code, C code file to Autolab, because everyone obviously gets individually graded and that gets tracked through Autolab. Okay, so uh, a few more things that we should kind of emphasize before moving over. Uh, there are going to be trace examples, and we'll see more of this when we actually kind of download the files and examine them. But these trace examples are going to provide what must be executed, and you should understand what's happening with these trace examples. Each of the trace examples, these are the things that are worth the individual points that culminate into the total amounts of points that you get that you end up coming away with for this uh, for this lab. So each student obviously should be able to demonstrate how each trace example executes and interacts with their implementation. Like, so you should feel confident that you can go from trace one all the way through trace 16 and understand what your shell needs to do to pass this test. And we'll talk more about that when we come to the uh, verifying your shell uh, implementation. And one way to do this is just to kind of sync up and constantly be in communication with your team, dissect the trace examples, talk about them, and show what parts of the shell kind of match up to what that task is. Now, there's a single deadline, so I'm mainly going to use the PDF documentation as well. The PDF documentation states some things that I'm not going to take into account, uh, like I do want uh, group-based projects. I'm also only going to have a singular deadline for this project where you don't get like deduced points for not meeting the first deadline. Uh, but because there is a single deadline, definitely manage your time. Make sure you do your regular check-ins with your group. Make sure that you're making progress because this is probably one of the largest labs that we have inside this class.
And of course, uh, each group member should be able to uh, participate in that. <laughs> okay, so let's see here. So in order to go ahead and start your Shell Lab journey, the first thing you're gonna need to do is the initial setup. And so you can go to Auto Lab to initially get your Shell Lab-handout.tar file. Now I was having some issues getting this uploaded on uh, Auto Lab. So it, it might actually be uh, SH Lab uh, or Shell Lab-handout.tar. So just keep that in mind when you follow the instructions to be able to go ahead and download and uh, and uh, go ahead and untar it. But of course, the process by which you will untar this is gonna be very similar to what we've done in our other labs. And in fact, I'll take a moment here to go over and do this process. So I'm gonna to jump to my applications, I'm gonna to go to the internet here, I'm gonna to go to my Chromium browser, I'm gonna, I'm already in auto lab, but here I'll even type out and go to auto lab. So it brings me to the home screen here. I'm going to scroll down to, I can either go to shell lab and I'll just do that shell lab here. And then inside of shell lab, I have this ability to get this handout. So I'm going to go ahead and request that handout. And there it is. And notice, yeah, there's the, the two underscores on this particular one. I kind of did something goofy there. Okay. So let me, um, close out of this. And so I'm going to go to my downloads folder here. And so inside of my downloads folder is going to be my, um, the lab. So here I'll go into 2467. I made a shell lab uh, directory already. There's nothing in there. So I'll just go ahead and move that in here. And this will be my workspace. And I'll go ahead and untar that. And I'll be very bad and just use the GUI instead of the command line because uh, it's much more interesting on a on a video. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now let's open up our uh, to our terminal. And so now if I go and ls, I'm going to see all these files in there. And in fact, if I open it to here, we can see also a graphical depiction of all of this. Excellent. Okay, so that's how you're going to get all your starter files. Okay, so eventually we're also going to go ahead, ahead and run uh, make inside of this directory to make some of the utility applications that's going to allow us to be able to test our shell out. We will look at that in just a few moments. And in fact, let's see what the readme document on here says. So, uh, what do we have? Let's do this. Cat, read me, um, read me, and there we go. We have the read me on the shell lab, all the files and the description of what each of the files are. So we can say we have a make file, which is going to compile your shell program and run the test. We have this read me file, which is what we're reading. We have the th uh, the the tiny shell code, which is our boilerplate code. This is going to be the shell program that you're going to write and have to hand in. This is what you're going to get a grade on. You're going to have a tiny shell reference. So this is a binary file. You don't have the source code for it, but this is a binary file that's given to you that will execute inside of the systems lab environment. And so you can actually compare the output from the reference shell to the um, code that you go ahead and produce. And so the way you get points is that your code, your tiny shell has to have all the same outputs and behaviors as the reference tiny shell. Okay, so the remaining files are gonna be used to test your shell. So we have our shell driver .perl script. This is going to uh, do all the trace driven shell drivers. So when we look at what these traces are, we're going to understand how what gets fed into them. What is our test harness is this application here. And we will actually be able to uh, alias, use an alias inside of our make to be able to uh, use that quite uh, easily. Uh, we have some text files, which are effectively going to be our test configuration files, which are going to uh, uh, feed instructions to our uh, our um, shell driver script. And so we'll take a look at that in a moment too. We have um, our uh, tshell.out, which is the example output of the reference shell on all of the 15 traces. 
We have then some little C utility programs that are going to be called buyer trace files in order to perform the testing. So we have like my spin, which takes an argument n and spins for n number of seconds. Uh, we have my split, which forks a child that spins for n number of seconds. We have my stop, which spins for n seconds and sends a uh, a signal um, to to itself. Uh, and then we'll have my int short for interrupt that spins for n seconds and sends a signal to itself. In this case, it's a stop signal. In the other case, it's an interrupt signal. Okay, so with that said, let's talk a little bit about understanding what is a Unix shell. Let's kind of give a motivation and a preface to this. What is a shell? Well, Unix shell is an interactive command line interpreter that acts as an interface between the user and the operating system. So its function is it allows us to interpret commands entered by the user, that's us, and run programs accordingly. And of course, shells, we'll, we'll look at this in a moment, but shells have built-in commands, but they also have the, act, the ability to launch external applications or programs as well. So let's go deeper into this and talk a little bit about a command line interface. Whenever we talk about a command line, we're talking about a sequence of ASCII text words, effectively, um, uh, as input by the user, which the shell reads or parses into standard input. So that's our standard in. It typically consists of common uh, commands followed by arguments. And so your arguments will usually be like, uh, have some kind of symbol to, um, to uh, state that it's an argument, like a dash and then uh, a particular letter, or it could even be a full word. And usually all of the, um, the tokens inside of our, uh, command line is delimited with white space. So com uh, commands typically start with the program name or a built-in command for the shell, followed by the arguments that modify the behavior of that particular command or that program that you're looking to launch from your shell. So the built-in commands versus executable programs. So it's kind of take just a moment just to, to pay respect to that. Uh, our built-in commands would be, say, for instance, like the command jobs are executed directly within the shell itself. Uh, quit's another one. That's going to be the first one that we're going to have to implement, that we're going to actually implement that one inside of this, uh, this lecture today. Other commands specify the path to an executable, which tells uh, the shell where to go to uh, get the application and to launch it, creating a new process. So let's talk about jobs and process groups. A job is a set of processes that are started by a single command line and can be controlled together. So jobs can be run in the foreground where the shell waits for the job to finish before taking another next command. Or it can also run in the background where the shell immediately returns to the prompt after starting the job and that prompt runs in the background and we are not uh, delayed. So let's talk a little bit more about foreground versus background jobs. So a foreground job by is the one that is usually uh, used by default. It commands, uh, commands run in the background by default. That's a really word a sentence, sorry. But it, it just means that the shell waits for the job to finish before accepting any new input. Whereas the background jobs, we can make a job background by appending an ampersand to our command line when we run it, and that'll make it a background uh, job, and then allows the shell to accept new commands immediately without having to wait for that job to complete. So just to give you an instance of what that looks like, uh, uh, foreground versus background, I have this instance where we're calling ls to kind of list all of your directories. Uh, and so we, we have our command, we have our argument that's gonna modify the behavior on our command, the dash L and the dash D. And notice since we do not go ahead and follow it up with a uh, with an ampersand that's gonna run the foreground. So we're gonna have to wait for it to produce a result before we can do anything else. Whereas the second variant, it's all the same command. We just have the addition of the ampersand, which now runs it in the background. 
So let's talk a little bit about job control. So job control refers to the ability to move jobs between the background and foreground and to change their states. Now, typically you have uh, the states of a running job, a uh, stop job and a terminated job. Commands for job control include BG to continue a job in the background and FG to move a job to the foreground. So you can, you can move them back and forth as necessary. Let's talk a little bit about the signals. Signals are a form of software interrupts. And when I say software interrupts, what I really mean to intend to say is it's a form of an inner process communication so that one process can effectively talk to another process within our shell uh, to send a process to perform some kind of specific action. Uh, so these actions are then encoded inside of the signals. So like we said, we had SIGINT, which is an interrupt signal. Uh, typically that can be sent if we do that control C combo on our keyboard. And so that can terminate uh, the foreground job. Uh, we also have the, uh, the SIG TSTP, which is a stop signal typically sent when we do control Z is press and that stops the foreground job until it's continued with a SIG CONT or SIG continue, uh, uh, continue signal. Let's talk a little bit about the process group work around. So when a shell script runs, it's part of the foreground process group. Any child process created inherits this group by default. So if you wanna prevent a signal from affecting both the shell and its child processes incorrectly, a child process should change its processor group using a set PGID. So PG short for process group. So set process group ID, and then you can pass it these parameters. Okay, just some critical concepts to highlight for you. The shell's ability to control jobs is crucial for multitasking and managing multiple processes efficiently. And understanding the signals and their default um, actions is pretty vital for writing robust shell programs and handle your user interrupts uh, gracefully. Okay, so let's give specifications on what you're actually gonna be doing. Uh, for tiny shell. So we will have a prompt string. And so the shell prompt should display a effectively uh, a message, tiny shell, and then it's waiting for you, the user, to supply it with a, uh, a string of tokens that it can parse and then uh, do something in response to that uh, to signal readiness for the user. Okay, so once we get past, so once we get to the point where you've, you're able to prompt, the, uh, the tiny shell, then you have your command line interpretation where commands entered by the user consists of a program name or a built-in command followed by arguments separated by spaces. And if, uh, if the inner command is not a built-in, then our tiny shell should uh, treat it as a path to an executable and run it as a new process termed a job. And then we should also support input output directions. So our tiny shell must allow redirection of program output using the uh, greater than less than symbols where the, um, the greater than is for uh, redirection on input and the less than is for redirection on output. Just some use cases, which you've probably already seen either throughout this semester or in prior classes on how we use redirects on, at the command line level. Okay, so more information about the specifications for our tiny shell. Uh, we need to be able to also support job control signals. So if you do control C, it should send um, an interrupt signal to terminate the current foreground job. And if you hit control Z, it should send a stop signal to stop the current foreground job until it's continued with a continue signal. So, uh, it should support also your background versus foreground jobs. So if a command ends with an ampersand, your tiny shell should execute it as a background job, allowing the prompt to return immediately. Without the ampersand, the job is run by default in the foreground. So the shell would then wait for its completion before returning to the prompt. We have to support job identification. Jobs can be identified by a process ID, which we'll call a PID, or a job ID, which we'll call a JID within uh, our tiny shell. JIDs, our job IDs, are denoted with a uh, percent sign on the command line. So for instance, percent five 
would represent a JID5. It's built-in commands that we will have to have support in our tiny shell is going to be quit, which allows us to exit the shell. The jobs command that's going to list all of our background jobs, the BG, and then a job ID, which continues a stop job in the background, or the F FG job, which moves a job to the foreground and continues if it uh, if it's stopped. We're going to have to be able to handle reaping zombie processes. So our tiny shell must handle terminated jobs that have not been waited on by the parent, known as zombies. It should print a message if a job terminates unexpectedly due to an uncaught signal. We need to have the following function implementation. So these functions are stubbed inside of our tiny shell, but they're not actually uh, have any meaningful uh, behaviors defined or, or really code ascribed to them. So you'll have the eval function, which is responsible for parsing and executing your command line. You'll have a built-in command or a CMD function, which is gonna handle our built-in commands or that, that do things with our shell, such as quit or the FG uh, or the BG or the jobs functions uh, or, or um, built-in commands that we talked about earlier. We'll have the do BGFG function, which implements the functionality of BG and FG commands, and then wait FG, which ensures that the shell waits for the foreground job to complete before moving on to the next task, like printing out the next prompt message. Um, and then also we're gonna be responsible for ensuring that there are signal handlers. So you're gonna have your SIG uh, child handler, which deals with terminator stop child processes. You'll have your signal interrupt handler, which handles your SIG int signals. And you'll have your SIG uh, stop handler, which handles your uh, stop signal uh, events. So as you're implementing this, how are you gonna validate your tiny shell? How do you know if you've implemented it right? Well, you're gonna to have tools available for testing. That's why we have so much files as part of this starter set. So for you, the tools for testing is you'll have a reference solution, which is our tiny shell ref. It's gonna be a Linux executable that acts as the reference behavior for your shell. So you're not giving the source code to this, but you are giving a executable that you can launch from the command line and you can feed it the instructions. You can even run the, uh, the uh, tester harness on this and send traces to that. And we'll actually look at that over the course of this particular lecture. Uh, you'll also have the shell driver script. That's the sdriver.pl. That's a Perl script, uh, a program that runs your shell with specified inputs and checks for the correct output. So you'll use the shell driver. So the shell driver runs our tiny uh, shell. It can also run our, uh, our tiny shell reference as a child process, and it's gonna send commands and signals based off of the trace file. It's gonna capture the output from our shell then and allow you to compare it against expected results. So these trace files are what we're really gonna use to evaluate and validate and verify your tiny shells. So the trace files provide predetermined sets of inputs and outputs for testing your shell, and the lower number traces are simpler, while obviously the higher number traces are gonna be much more complex. So let's talk about the testing procedure for being able to actually test your uh, tiny shell while you're implementing it. Uh, you're going to want to run your shell using the trace file, using a command line, such as, a, so we're launching from the command line, the um, S driver, the shell driver script, and we're going to give it uh, a, a particular trace file that you want to evaluate. So you put dash T and then trace, uh, in this instance, it would be the first trace file. And then you want to give it the uh, the arguments on being able to go ahead and what you're launching. So in this instance, we want the shell that we're launching to be our tiny shell. Whereas if we wanted to compare it to the reference shell, we would give it the reference shell. So notice this part in both these instances on whether we're running the test script to the, the test 
harness on our own implementation versus the reference implementation is the same, right? It's just this uh, argument on whether it is our tiny shell versus the tiny shell reference is what's going to change. And then this latter part, uh, the dash A, and then inside of the string dash P is going to emit the prompts. So we don't see that when it goes and runs the testing. So we just get the, the output. Now there's a much easier way than to run our, our test procedures than having this big long command that launches again, the application and the, the series of, um, of um, uh, inputs that you're going to require for it to, to launch. We have these aliases where you just do make, and then if it's trace one you want, then test zero one, test zero two, test zero three, and that will automatically effectively, effectively alias this line to run the test on trace one or trace two or trace three on your tiny shell. And if you make our test or for reference test, zero, one, zero, two, or whatever uh, trace number you're actually on, that'll go ahead and run that test harness on the reference. Again, what we're gonna see is that you want your output to match the output from the reference. That's what's actually gonna net you your points. So your shell's output should match the reference solution uh, with the exception of process IDs, right? Those are always gonna di differ because those are gonna be unique. So your auto lab will grade your, and so you're gonna supply, you're gonna submit your tiny shell.c file. That's the one that you're gonna be um, encoding. And uh, and you'll, you'll get points based off of the max number of trace files. So this says it's 20 trace files, but uh, I have to double check and verify if 20 is the actual number, but just know you get two points uh, per trace file that that is there. And then, your full number of points is whatever the maximum number of trace files are. Now, if you want to check the difference to compare your output with the reference, we can go ahead and just do a diff uh, command inside of our standard shell, the shell that you're going to be using, not your tiny shell. And you can call that make, say, for instance, this is on make test 007. So this would be trace seven on your own implementation for tiny shell, this would compare it to the output from the make on the, uh, so what we're doing is we're doing a redirect. So the parentheses prioritizes this operation. So it's gonna wait for this to resolve to get the output, the standard out, and then that standard out will then be redirected into the dip application, this diff utility uh, application inside of our shell. And so this takes two parameters where it's normally two text files that is comparing the diff between, well, this will generate effectively two text files and redirect them, or the output actually from our uh, standard out into our standard in here onto our diffs so that we can then go ahead and look at the uh, discrepancies without actually having to save the output into files to do the diff on. And then another alternative way that you can go ahead and check is just to run this script uh, check uh, tiny shell script. It's a Python script and that'll do a pre preliminary check on all your tests and will notify you of any failures and gives you what your score will be. It'll actually uh, give you the culmination, the summation of all possible points you can get. Of course, once you're ready to submit, you do have to submit your uh, tiny shell code onto uh, Autolab. And that's where you will get your official grading. So everything up to that point is just allows you to evaluate to see what where you're at in terms of your own grading. And just some tips for effective testing, always check your work after making any changes and utilize the reference solution from the tiny shell reference, just to clarify any uncertainties you might have. But you're given all the tools you need to test. Now, let's give you some hints and tips that'll be, uh, uh, that will help you along this journey of implementing a shell. So first of all, 
recommended reading, actually should be required reading. This lab heavily pulls from chapter eight of the textbook. So learn that chapter very well. Uh, exceptional control flow. Read it closely for examples and concepts on control flow in Unix systems. And while you can use code excerpts in the textbooks, please make sure to cite and uh, explain them inside of your source code so to guarantee that you have a strong understanding of what's happening so that you're not just copy and pasting code, but you're getting an appreciation of how shells are actually implemented. Now, uh, for in terms of implementing shell features, IO redirections and signal handling. Uh, so we'll talk more about that, obviously, in, in class. And we'll try to do a walkthrough to try to show you how to do some of these traces. So that is what my goal is for these next remaining uh, lectures until we get to the end of this lab. Uh, and the trace files are also going to be a very critical asset to you. You'll, you'll use those as your step-by-step -step guide to ensure that your cell's output matches the reference, uh, starting with trace one and moving until you run out of trace files, because then you've accumulated all your points then. And just some important functions you should be aware of would be like uh, wait PID, um, uh, the, the, the kill function, the fork function, uh, uh, the EX, ECV, e, the, the set PG ID and the uh, SIG prog mask functions are all going to be ones that are pre, they're given to you. They're ones that you can call from the system, but they're going to be crucial for your shell's functionality. And when it comes to uh, options with weight PID, you might want to look at these particular options as well. So the W untraced and the W no hang options are going to be ones that you'd want to look into. And we'll talk more about that as we get deeper and deeper into this particular lab. Now, in terms of signal handlers, you want to ensure that you send signals like SIG int and SIG to, uh, S to stop to the entire foreground process uh, group with the correct syntax using the kill function. Consider how you divide responsibilities between your weight FG and your uh, signal child handler functions to uh, possibly use a busy loop and a single call to weight PID. Uh, so uh, in terms of just some hints for your process groups, you set PGID. Like we said earlier, just to place a child process in its own process group, preventing it from being interrupted by signals meant for the shell and ensure that the child unblocks the SIG child signal before executing a new program to prevent any kind of race conditions. Uh, do debug with the uh, debugger, right? So if, for instance, you encounter a segmentation fault, the debugger can help identify the exact line of C code that causes the issue. If you run your shell with the debugger, input commands that cause the crash, you can use the debugger to, to examine that. And just some practical examples, um, you know, debugging examples we'll look at inside these lectures and just the signal handling. In terms of how you will be scored, uh, it's just two points per um, trace file. I, I think some of the trace files were actually eliminated. I think maybe the, the we'll see when this is submitted. Uh, but uh, I don't think that there's actually 20 trace files total. So it'll just be the sum of however many trace files there are. Uh, but do comment your code because that's really going to be the more interesting thing, especially since we're going to be stepping through a lot of this lab inside of our lecture time. So I just want to ensure that everyone has strong understandings as to what's being implemented inside your tiny shell. And of course, you can also test with Autolab simply by um, submitting it and waiting for it to run its score. It might take a few minutes to do that, and then it'll go ahead and give you the response. And just like all the other labs, you can submit multiple times and check your result, and you'll get whatever the most recent submission uh, value is as your score. And of course, you can always just run that check T, uh, tiny shell Python script, because that's effectively what's going to be running in Autolab as well. That's what's going to be evaluating to see uh, and give you and grant you your points for this lab. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the tiny shell reference uh, uh, code that we're going to give to you, the application we're going to give to you. So the TSH ref is going to act as your benchmark to show the expected outcomes when executing commands in our Unix shell. So we're going to utilize our uh, tiny shell ref to validate the accuracy of our own shell implementation by comparing the behaviors. So here, why don't we go ahead and take a look at this. So let me jump over here and uh, let's clear this terminal here. Okay, so again, when I look at this, I see, oh yeah, look at this. I have a couple of executable files. I have lots of text files. We're gonna kind of examine a couple of these. Um, the one executable, viable, uh, executable file is my tiny shell ref. And as I said before, I don't have the source code for that, but I can, I can, I can launch that. And so I'm going to launch that and play around to get an idea of what my shell should be capable of. And then I have my testing applications. So my shell driver application is going to be what allows me to go ahead and kind of launch using all of these traces. And these are the traces. Oh, we do. I see all 20 of these traces. So then we, we will have 20 traces that you have to get through. Each is worth two points. So this lab is worth 40 points total. And then we also have our, um, our check tiny shell here as well, which will run and do an accumulation of all the possible points that you have for all 20 of your traces. Okay, so if I want to start my tiny shell, right, this is going to be the command I can use to launch it from my command line. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's, okay, let's clear first and let's do a launch. Okay, so once we launch, notice we're given the, the prompt TSH to say, hey, I'm aware, I'm alert, and now it's waiting for the user to supply a command uh, line uh, string effectively to uh, to the system standard input so that it can parse it and do something interesting. So now one thing to keep in mind is that it's not going to use uh, relative paths. You give complete paths to some of the applications you want to run. So say, for instance, if we want to run the uh, LS application, the command line utility, we would have to go ahead and give it the full path. So slash bin slash LS. And there we go. We could see I can go ahead and evaluate and get all of the uh, files and directories inside my current directory. I should also be able to uh, do that with any kind of uh, additional augmentation uh, parameters such as being able to try to include permissions or ownerships or timestamps. So I should be able to parse that, right? So let's do this again. So bin ls dash l, and there we go. We could see we get the same output in our tiny shell application that we should get from our bash shell or z shell or whatever you might be using. Uh, we should be able to check the process status. So this is gonna show the current processes running in the system. Let's take a look at this. Here we can see our processes right now. All the processes we have are P PS, our tiny shell reference and bash. And We can also go ahead and do a background execution. And here we can call the uh, the sleep application. This is gonna put the sleep command to run the background for three seconds. So this is a numerical number of seconds of uh, time we will sleep. And we're gonna put that in the, uh, if, if we do that as a background, notice what's gonna happen. Actually, let's do it like this. Let's do this first. Notice here, if we do that, we waited three seconds before I was able to feed another command into my shell. So here, let's do this with our ampersand, which is gonna make this a background process. And you're gonna see very instantly, it's reporting, oh, this is in the background. And we can see I could have instantly 
started typing a new command to put into my shell right away. And then we can also just take a look at jobs as well. And we can see jobs. Uh, let's do this again. Bin sleep three ampersand. Oops, can't do that. Okay, ampersand. And then let's see, let's do jobs. And we can see if we do that quick enough that we still have that one job that's currently running. And it's going to give me the job ID and process ID. And now it's complete and what the job actually is. So now it's not showing up any longer. Okay, so we looked a little bit about uh, our tiny uh, shell, our reference shell, right? So this is the behavior that our shell should have when we're done implementing it. Uh, and again, we're gonna test it using all these trace applications. We also have to be able to quit out of it. <laughs> we don't even have quit implemented in our, uh, our initial version of our tiny shell. So there's a, a lot that's gonna have to be done. And here, let me just clear my terminal from my uh, bash shell here. Okay, so in order to build our initial code base, what we're going to want us to do is we're going to start with the command make to compile all the provided boilerplate code. And this will, will create the executable files for the source code, which will be used to test our shell. So uh, this will allow us to actually build our tiny shell, which won't be able to do much as we'll see. Uh, it's going to build an application, a simple program called MySpin, which allows us to effectively just uh, spin for some user specified uh, amount of time, uh, n number of seconds effectively. I have my split, which is gonna be a program that forks a child that spins for some n number of seconds. I have my stop, which is gonna be a program to stop itself for debugging purposes. And my int, which is a program that generates and interrupts. My read, which is gonna be a program to test shell reading. So these are all gonna be the quintessential uh, uh, little utility applications that our tester is going to invoke from our shell to try to evaluate its behavior, to be able to launch background and foreground and be able to wait and be able just to see how effectively uh, everything is implemented uh, for being able to manage these processes. So how are we going to use it? These uh, compiled applications will serve as our test cases to validate our uh, shells functionalities such as our job control and our signal handling. And they're going to simulate various behaviors of programs that your shell will be able to handle correctly. And in fact, that's how you're going to be able to get your points. So just some demonstrations of how we might be able to actually use these applications. Like we can use these applications. They're not specific to our tiny shell. We can use them from our bash shell or Z shell as well. So let's take a look at that, for instance. Let's just go over here. And uh, I have to make them, haven't made anything yet, right? So if I just go make, the first thing that's going to do is we should go ahead and make all of these applications. And once I have these applications, I should be able to launch them just like any other kind of command line utility. So my spin, and then I give it some number of seconds, and we can see we're going to have to wait three seconds. And now we're back. And we have, what, what was the other one? Was my, um, was it split? I believe it was my split and I could do say for instance, three seconds and we could see that looks very similar to what I just did, but actually it's launching a child process. So if I wanted to like uh, really take a look at that, let's actually launch into, um, and also let me, let me see here. Should be able to, Yep, launch all of these applications from our tiny shell, just like our uh, just like from our bash shell, right? That's one of the points of building our own shell. And let's do this one. Perfect. So we can see we're launching these little applications in our tiny shell. And actually, why don't we launch some of our other applications just to observe what some of the background execution job controls look like. From ours. So here we're going to in the foreground, I mean, in the background, uh, launch my split. So let's do this. And when we do that, we're going to look at both jobs and our, uh, our programs uh, uh, status. Uh, 
10, 10. Okay, and run that in the background and let's look at jobs and let's look at the program status. And so here, what you can find interesting is that we have the job that we're running, but notice in our program status, because of how my split works is it creates, uh, from the parent, it creates a child process. So now it actually, we have two different process IDs, right? One for the parent, one for the child that exists. So these are all gonna be the interesting things we get to learn about as we develop our tiny shell. And of course, there's other things we can do, like learn how to sleep and uh, reap uh, zombie processes or set something to complete. We will play around with that as we continue moving forward. It's just kind of an illustration of how these, uh, these utility applications are gonna be used by our tiny shell and how they're even accessible from just our standard shell that we're using. Okay, let's take a look at some of the boilerplate code for our tiny shell before we start kind of trying to uh, examine this. I'm gonna show you highlights on the slide, but then we'll just open up a source code file and look at it. So uh, one important thing I want you to look at inside of this source code that I'm gonna highlight here is a uh, struct. We have a struct, a job structure that is gonna have the, uh, the PID and the JID for a job, as well as its current state, whether it's the background or foreground or whether it's stopped, as well as the command line. Uh, the argument for what that 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 uh, job is. So this is effectively the data that's carried for each job. The stub functions that we will be responsible for having to complete to get this lab done are going to be these. And I think we've already mentioned these prior, but they should even have a comment in there that says, here are the functions that you will implement. That's the eval the built-in CMD, the do BGFG, the do redirect, the wait FG. And then we also have our signal handlers, right? Our child signal handler, our stop signal handler, and our interrupt signal handler. And also one thing inside of our main loop, our main loop is going to be quite big. And if we uh, go down to it, the thing we really want to be evaluating, the thing that allows us to constantly feed and uh, new instructions to our, our shell is going to be what's called or referred to as the REVEL, which is going to be a read evaluate process loop. So let's kind of let's kind of break this down a little bit. We can see there's a loop structure with this while loop. It's it's looped on one because it just keeps working indefinitely every time. It's it's there's the amount of instructions you should be able to feed to your rebel, to your shell, should be an unlimited amount, number until you're ready to quit. So we're just gonna loop indefinitely. And then what we have here is we're going to uh, parse the, we're gonna read the, uh, the string, the command line that's given to us from the user. We're gonna evaluate that string. So we're gonna parse it and see what are the instructions? Is it a built-in command or is it an external application we're trying to launch? And then we're going to process whatever we evaluated. And once we're done processing it, then we're ready to read the next instruction from the user. So that's what's referred to as a REPL. And you'll see that's what's given to us uh, actually inside of our, uh, our um, T-shell code, our tiny shell. Okay, and this is a good opportunity actually just to go and take a look at that. So let me go over here and let's take a look at our T-shell. So again, we have all of this code that we'll start with. Let's take a look at our C code. Now look, I already have an executable. I can, I can show you what happens when I launch my executable, but we'll see. So we saw how with well, we'll look at this in more in just a moment, but we could see I can launch, oh, um, let me quit. I'm already in my reference. Okay, so I can quit out of my reference. We actually have something we can launch, right? The problem is we can't even quit out of it. Look, if I hit quit, that's actually the first thing we have to do. Uh, we Well, let me try to control C. Well, remember control C, that's an interrupt. That doesn't work either. 
Control Z. Nope, that doesn't work. Yeah, uh, let's do this. Um, let's go to open tab. Uh, by yeah, just close that terminal. Yeah, so you can see we have very stubbed out implementation that offers almost no default um, uh, uh, user interactions. We're going to really have to implement all those out. But with that said, let's take a look at the code that we do have so we can take and examine it. And so the, this should have the highlights that I showed you earlier. But feel free to look through this code yourself to get a good, strong understanding. You could see the headers that we're including here. You could see uh, what we're defining as our constants in terms of the maximum number of arguments on a command line, the maximum line size for a command line, the maximum number of jobs at any point, and then finally, the maximum number of job IDs that we can have. Okay, we have some uh, job states here, right? So FG is our foreground job. Undefined is zero. Uh, BG is a background job and ST is a stop job. So we have some constants that defined our uh, job state. And then here we can see some of the global variables that we'll have access to in all of our functions. And we have this structure as well, which is our job structure, which I highlighted and showed to you. And then we kind of broke this down. We have our function prototypes. So again, this is what I showed in the earlier slide these are going to be all the functions that we're going to be responsible for having to implement. And then here we're going to have a collection of um, our function prototypes. This is going to be a list of functions that we are given that we can call upon that are fully implemented. So we won't have to make any changes to any of these here. So please read through these, see if you can't learn what these do, as we'll make use of these inside of the functions that we do have to implement. Then after that, you'll see we have our uh, main function, which is going to have some various checks that it can do. It's going to parse the command line. It's going to install the signal handlers for us. It's going to, and then here, this is the, this is the part, this is the actual rebel part. This is going to execute the shells read eval loop, where eval is going to be one of those functions that we're going to be really responsible for implementing ourselves. And then you can see there's going to be lots of comments that are going to tell you what are going to be necessary for some of these functions. But you see, for instance, with eval, it's just a blank function at the moment. It's just a return. You can see here for parse line, for instance, parse line is a function that's given to us that should parse the line. So you, we have a very deep implementation for that already, but understand what it returns back and why it returns that. And then we have built-in command function that takes in the uh, a pointer of our arguments, an array of arguments, of strings, or character pointers. But right now, it doesn't have any implementation. It just returns back a zero because it returns back an integer. So that's just a stubbed implementation. Yeah, and you could see it's just going to be a collection of all the functions that are declared as the ones you have to have implemented. There's almost no functionality there. That's that's what the responsibility of the lab is going to be all about. Okay, so let's talk about our objective then. So your tiny shell should aim to emulate the reference shell, as I said earlier. So to ensure the consistency and reliability in uh, performance and output. So like a strategy is do incremental testing. Utilize the um, 16, there's actually 20. There's actually, uh, utilize the 20 provided trace files sequentially to rigorously test and validate the functionalities of your shell against the reference shell. 
And again, our reference shell is the TH, uh, TSH ref. And so some guidelines just for testing, start with your basic trace files, compare with the reference file, and just, you know, consistently try to slowly improve. Check for insights, check for abnormal behaviors. We already stated what the purpose of the shell driver script is, is to execute your shell program as a child process, sends those commands and signals based on the trace file, and it captures and displays the child's, which is your tiny shell, standard input and standard error. And so your trace file format is going to consist of lines that are commands or comments. So blank and com uh, comment lines starting with hashtag are ignored or echoed. So those, it doesn't try to evaluate. Driver commands for the testing harness for the Perl script for the uh, S driver, the shell driver, uh, are not passed to the child where shell, uh, shell commands are passed to the child through standard in. So there are certain key words that are designed to provide behavior to the S driver application. And there's certain key words that'll be inside the trace file that's fed to your tiny shell and your tiny shell is going to try to produce some text-based response to that command. So just so you know what the key driver commands are that are going to be in these trace files that don't go to the shell directly, but kind of uh, alter or change the behavior of the driver script are going to be TSTP that's going to send a, uh, a stop signal to the child, um, int, which is going to send a interrupt signal to the child, quit, which is going to send a quit signal to the child, kill, which is going to send a kill signal to the child, close, which is going to close the writer and send an end of file to the child, wait, which just waits for the child to terminate, and then sleep n, which is going to pause for n number of seconds. So if we want to look at what this actually looked like, and actually, why don't we just say, oops, let me, so let me close this, and actually, let's look at, we can actually, open this up this is a this is a Perl script and we can see we have some comments in here and the comments give us all these same instructions on how this works and what it does now we, we really don't care about parsing through the actual uh, contents of that once we know what the header comment states in terms of what are the commands what are the driver statements? that the S driver uses and what are the commands that our shell is going to use, we can start looking at, um, we can look at some of these trace files. So let's do that. The trace files are gonna actually act as, as a way, as a mechanism of, uh, of uh, testing our shell. So it feeds the instructions to the tester to uh, effectively like a unit test of sorts. So here we could see the all lowercase in this instance, quit is going to instruct your tiny shell to quit out. And so remember, we just tried to do tiny shell, like let, let's do that again. I'm gonna regret this, but uh, our tiny shell is currently, if we try to feed it that uh, string, right? It's not gonna do anything. It's just going to move on and say, okay, what else do you wanna do? It's gonna read, it's not evaluating, it's not processing that request. Uh, it might not be, it's, I mean, read, read it because I was able to submit it and then it just prompted me again. So we really just have a, a prompt loop going right now. So we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to go ahead and implement the evaluate and process portion of our rebel loop. So clearly when we go to do trace one, we could say it's not gonna do it. Well, well we're gonna test this out in just a moment. Uh, just just to prove this, just to, and we'll actually work through this first solution. So let me go ahead and um, uh, do this. Let's go here. Let's open a new, I'll close this process, close that terminal. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we're just stuck in our application at the moment. I can't do anything about it. Okay, so this is just gives you an illustration of what these traces look like. And, and, and clearly, as we, that was the first one, and just to give you more preference before we move on any in complexity, you could just see 
these trace files are going to get more and more complex instructions. So you can see the next one is going to invoke the uh, ls utility application to list the contents of the directory. Then it's going to sleep for a second and call it again. Then it's going to sleep for a second and call it again. So it's going to run a foreground job several times. And then if I wanted to see, the idea is that we slowly implement our tiny shell so we get past trace one, then we can work on trace two. Then once we're done trace two, we can learn, we can look at trace three, which gives us a description of what it does. Remember anything in the hashtags are ignored, but what's fed to our tiny shell is gonna be everything that's on the uppercase. So we could actually launch into our own tiny shell if we wanted to and try to type in these commands. You could launch into the tiny shell reference and actually see what happens. So actually let's do that just to show you here. I'm gonna do my tiny shell reference and say, oh, go ahead and I'll launch my spin one as a background application and then go ahead and do Oops. There we go. And then do that. So well, if, if minus my typo, you could see it should be able to do both those things. And if it does it successfully, if it produces the same output from our reference shell, your shell, then you get credit for that. Okay, so let's talk about how we can actually run those tests. So we saw how I could manually kind of type in those instructions, but let's actually use the test harness. And the easier way to use the test harness, as I said before, was to use like these uh, alias instructions where we can just make our test 01, which is gonna be for the trace 01 text file um, uh, commands, and it'll go ahead and spit out the output as generated from our reference tiny shell. So let's try that. Make um, our test 01, oh, zero 01. So that's reference test 01. And we can see, oh yeah, what we're gonna get is it's launching that much more complex Perl script with all of the modifiers that are required to run it the way we expect, but then the output we're gonna then generate is gonna be, oh, all the comments get displayed and then that's it because the only thing this does is it quits. But what if we try to run this on our current tiny shell that we've done no implementation on whatsoever? And we could actually see if we try to do that, and if I just hit, hit the make test zero one, I hang indefinitely because we've never, we've never implemented that quit. So you could see it's just waiting for that process to terminate, but we've never implemented that quit. So I'm actually gonna have to hit a control C on side of my, um, on side of my test application, which is going to bail me out. And so what we can do now, if I wanted to, is I can start to explore this space using the debugger. So if I wanted to use the debugger though, what I should do is I should go ahead and when I make my file, I should use this dash G. Did I, I think I, did I? Yeah, here we go. I give rationale as to why I want to do this, but this will make it much easier. In fact, let's do that really quick to see what happens uh, before we even start implementing anything. And so, so let's do GCC uh, dash G. This is going to be able to allow us to have much more verbose debugging opportunities with my debugger. And then I'm going to do, uh, what is this? This is my, this is going to be my tiny shell that we're going to do. And then we want the output application name to be TSH. And then bam. Okay, so now that we have that, let's call DBG, no, let's call GDB on our 
see it, our tiny shell. Okay, so we will do that. Now let's set a breakpoint for eval. We know that's one of the things that has to be implemented. It doesn't do anything. We looked at it, it's empty. So that's why we're not evaluating any commands. So let's break on the instance of eval. Okay, so we created a breakpoint. Let's go ahead and tell it to run. And let's give it, uh, okay, let's give it something like quit, for instance. And if I do that, uh, we can see uh, inside of this breakpoint, inside of my command line, so when eval is called, we're inside of eval, right? So when eval is called, uh, yeah, main eval, that's our breakpoint. Uh, we just have that return statement, but we can see we have this command line which is effectively quit with new line character. So we can see that quit, the string of quit is being uh, sent. In fact, let's see this. Let's, uh, let us do this. Let us um, run again and let's do a more complicated one. Let's suppose we did like bin ls-l-a. Uh, and we can say, yeah, so the entire string, no matter what is there, is currently being sent into our eval method. We're just not doing anything with it. So we now know where we need to go to start parsing our, uh, our line. So let's go ahead and just, at least for now, quit out of this, clear out of this. Okay. So here, Obviously, what we'd want to do is use some helper functions to be able to parse this, this string for us, right? And as we know, there's some strings that's already given to us. So say, for instance, we have, well, we're going to want to e implement our eval. We're going to want to implement our, um, our built-in command. So let's, let's look at this. So one of the functions that we know that we can access, and let's open up our uh, T shell C code here, is going to be this one. It's going to be this one. So, um, or let's look at our, our C code here. And let's see some of the helper functions that we think might be interesting. Let's see. That was our end of our list, other helper routines. Let's do this. See if there's one that parses. So here are our helper functions. One of the first helper functions is a parse line function that we can say takes in a command line from the user. It's going to take in a uh, character pointer of a arguments array. So let's go here and see if we can't. So here we have, so we can read the description. This is going to parse the command line and build the argv array. The characters enclosed in single quotes are treated as a single argument. That's good. That's what we have, right? And we're going to return true if the user has requested a background job and false if the user has requested a foreground job. So this is something we should keep in mind. We're returning back an int and this int is going to be effectively, let's say one on the end because it's effectively a Boolean uh, result. So say for instance, one, if it's a background job or non zero value for a background job and a uh, zero for a, um, if it's a, uh, a, a foreground job. But this is already implemented. So we should t uh, make use of this to parse our string.
Okay, so the idea on what we're going to do, and let's actually open up our code again. Let's go, I should have closed it. So there's there's two functions that we're really probably going to have to make use of for this first phase, because we can see right now, actually, I didn't show this either. So I showed how the test output was uh, different, but let's look at the uh, alternative way that we could test as well. Let's look at check tinyshell.py, because I'll be using this a lot when we initially launch this. It's launching, it's launching. And it might just be hung because we can't even quit out of it. So we'll, we'll test this one later. Yeah, look at this. This one's causing all sorts of issues. So we'll take a look at this one. In just a bit, let's let's finish implementing this first this first uh, uh, test. Okay, so let's go to our rebel and see what's happening with our rebel, and then kind of just drill down with everything. So we're going to go to our main function. We're going to go to where. Yeah, we're doing that. Okay, so here this is where we start executing the shells read evaluate loop, and then what we're doing here is. Let's, let's look at this. We are going to go ahead and read the command line. Then we're going to evaluate the command line. And so notice we're making a call to eval here. That's what we're looking at before. If we go ahead and jump over to eval, we can see it doesn't actually have anything. So let's start to define the behavior for eval that we expect it to have. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to create a argument array that will hold the command line arguments once they've been parsed. And so remember that max args was a predefined constant that specifies the maximum number of arguments that your shell can handle. So we're going to want to implement something like this initially, some local variable to handle the parsing, to capture the parsing of our all of our um, arguments. So let's go ahead and define that. So inside of here, let's do character pointer rv. And as we said here, we are going to define it the size of our max args. Okay, so now that we've done that, the next thing we're going to do is we're gonna create a variable that's gonna hold the integer result from when we try to parse a line, indicating whether a process should be run in the background or foreground. Remember, one of the things that parse line does is it checks to see, it checks for us if it's going to be a background or foreground and tells us one or zero, right? A non-zero value or zero if it's supposed to be a, um, a, uh, a foreground. So let's hold something. Let's create something just to store that. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do is actually assign to BG the result from parse line, which is made for us. Remember, parse line requires two arguments, the command line, which when we did a breakpoint on eval, we saw we already get into eval, right? But then we created the argv and we're gonna send a reference to argv to parse line so it can populate it for us and actually fill our command line arguments. So here, let's do bg is equal to parse line. And so inside of parse line, I'm gonna send it the command line that's sent to us from eval, and I'm gonna send it a reference to our argv. So that, so that it can populate argv based off of the contents and command line. Excellent. And then the last thing we're going to have to do at, for this particular function 
is we're actually going to want to invoke the built-in command argv. Remember, there's some built-in commands that we're going to care about. Did we talk about what the built-in commands are? There's going to be like a built-in command to the shell is quit. Obviously, that's the first one we're trying to do. Other built-in commands would be jobs, which we haven't implemented yet. Another, uh, Some other uh, built-in commands would be uh, fg or bg. If you recall, yeah, we had a slide that discussed that. So we would want to go ahead and have our command line arguments and then send that to our built-in command, which I think actually returns back something as well. We're gonna ignore what it turns back. So, but the, the built-in command, we'll, we'll look at it. It's stubbed out, it doesn't do anything yet. But what you traditionally do with it is it's called with the argument list that we generate from parsing our line. And then that function is gonna check to see if the command is a built-in uh, shell command like quit or jobs or whatever. And if it does, it's gonna execute it uh, and it'll handle it. And if it isn't, it's going to return back so that we can bypass and then like effectively fork to create a child process so that we can call whatever non-built-in command we want the shell to go ahead and execute if it wants to launch some utility application and uh, run that and then uh, return back to the rebel loop. So that's the general idea. So built-in does return back some status that's going to affect uh, future implementations, but we're going to ignore that for now. And we'll just add in the return data as we actually need it. For quitting, we're just going to quit out. So it's going to not be very meaningful, but we are going to have to invoke this. And it is something that's built in, right? If I go back up, let's, let's do this really quick. Uh, before I even implement it, let's do control F built in. Yeah, we could see I have this built-in uh, function right here. It just it just doesn't it just returns zero because it returns an int. But if the user has typed the built-in command, we execute it immediately. So we're gonna have to implement this, and we're giving our argument v. I'm not gonna implement it yet though because I'm, I'll do the breakpoint on it, right? But we can see uh, we do this is gonna be the next thing. But let's do some debugging first. Let me finish out. I know that I need to, uh, and in fact. The other, let me, let me do this. Because we see this is the stubbed out implementation, but if we go to where the prototypes are all defined at, we're like, oh yeah, look, that's also the next function under eval that's listed under here are functions you will implement. And you kind of see that these functions are defined almost in a way that we can kind of easily and nicely read through uh, what we'll have to do. And again, learn the helper routines that we'll rely on. Okay, so let's go back down over to our uh, eval then. So let's jump to eval. And inside of eval, what I'm going to do is we will call um, that um, built-in um, uh, CMD, I'm sorry, built in CMD. And we will pass it in our argv, I believe is what it is that we're going to need to do. So once we do that, that's going to be the basic implementation for just evaluating a prompt, right? So we're going to create an array that can hold up to the maximum number of arguments. We're going to create a variable that holds whatever the integer value that represents a background versus foreground result. We're going to call this helper function parse line passing in the command line and this empty uh, argument array. And that's going to populate that for us. And then we're going to send that in to our built in command function, which we have not implemented yet. But now what we can do is, oh, don't want to do. Uh, let me get rid of that. So what I do want to do at this moment is save. Let's save that. And now let's try testing this again. So here, what I can do is let's uh, recompile. And again, I want to compile so to get the debugger the, the uh, with a dash G that's going to give me the additional debugger support, some, some additional text. And then I can go ahead and I can go ahead and let's run our debugger. Let's create a break. Now, instead of uh, breaking on eval, I could still break on eval, and I will. Let's break on eval, 
but I can also break on um, uh, built in uh, command, right? Let's do that. Okay. And now, but I, yeah. And now let's go ahead and just run. Okay, so I run, it's gonna ask for something. Suppose I wanna hit something like, uh, uh, let's do something more complex, ls-l-a, let's hit enter. And the reason why I want to try to, okay, so let's, let's, let's step through this. So let's do next instruction. So notice another nice thing about what I get when I use the dash um, G is I'm actually seeing the instruction I'm currently executing, not in assembly instructions, but actually inside of C instructions, which makes it very nice to kind of read through. So here, let me go to um, the, I'm just gonna hit next and now I'm at parse line. Okay, so at this point, I'm parsing line. I'm I'm I, I'm giving it my argv. I'm going to go down to the next instruction onto built-in command. So here now, what I want to do is I want to print argv, and we can actually inspect then inside of our debugger a debugger the contents of my local variable. So I can see, yeah, look, we've successfully parsed the LS. And now let me print out um, argv at index one, and that's my dash L, nice. And then finally, let me do argv at index two, and that's dash A. And then finally, let me do a print of argv at index three, and we can see, nope, that's my null character, which represents that this is the end of the array. So yeah, let's um, let's actually run this again. And let's actually this time type in quit. And so now if I print my, um, oh, let me go to next. So let's walk down this. I'm currently inside of eval. So here I am now at the, let's uh, eval. I'm at the command line. I'm defining the, and then we're going to the built in perfect. So now let me print argv zero. And we can say, yes, I, I do have my quit. And then, then if I do my print argv one, that's going to be my null symbol. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, we can say we're properly pro parsing the command lines into tokens. And each of these uh, uh, tokens are effectively inside of our argv array. And then we're going to jump. Actually, let me go down to next then. And so that's going to bring me to the built-in command. But remember, my built-in command is nothing at this point. We, uh, we can just see we're getting a reference to the argv array getting passed into it. OK, so the next thing we need to do now that we see, we have examined, we've used the debugger to kind of see how code is flowing from our main function to our eval function, now into our built-in command function, we need to do something in response to this argv array to make a decision on exiting out our application if the uh, command was to quit, right? That's the first thing we have to implement. So what are we going to do inside of... Um, what are we going to do inside of our uh, built-in command? Well, let's do the following. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to grab quit is, uh, so for the quit keyword uh, or for any of the built-in functions, in fact, they don't take any arguments. So we only care about the first element inside of our argument v, our argv uh, array. So we're going to grab that first element and save it to a variable. So let's do that. Let's go to built-in commands. So let's um, let's quit out of this. Let's just clear out of this. Okay, perfect. 
Now let's go to here and actually let's go to our, let's go to our built in perfect. And so I'm going to jump here. And right now we have no implementation. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to create a character pointer. And we're going to want to effectively grab our command. And that's just going to be the very first element of our argv array so that we can inspect that and do a comparison of it. OK. so. Uh, that's going to be a pointer declared to the first element of argv. Then we're going to want to do a string comparison. So we're going to want to compare our string, the command that we have, to the word, the literal string quit. And so remember, since these are um, effectively non-primitive data types, right? Since strings are more complex, we have the string comparator function we can call. And so if two strings have no differences between them, if they are uh, exactly the same, it returns back a value of zero. So we'll check to see if the result of a string compare between our command and quit uh, string is zero. And if it is, then we're going to do something in response to that. So let's go ahead and type that up. So let's jump here. So if inside of here, oops, we do a string compare. And inside of our string compare, we're going to compare our command, the, the string argument, the first element from our, our arguments array to the string literal of quit. And we want to see if that is equal to zero. And if it is, Okay, so if it is, then we want to do something in response to that. And so what we're gonna wanna do in response is we're gonna wanna go ahead and exit using the standard library, which is available to us, and this will just exit our application, right? So we wanna exit, uh, we wanna call the exit function, which will terminate the calling process and just, uh, just to make our, our application stop. And it'll, it'll uh, give it with the status of zero, which is fine. This, this is what we wanted. We requested an exit, so it's a, a zero value is apt for the exit status code here. OK, and, I, and that's it. That's, that's, so, so we get the argument array. We grab the first element. We compare to see if it's quit. If it is, then we're going to exit. Let's save that. And then let's see what happens. So let's close this. So now at this point, I feel like this should work. I can throw it in the debugger or I can just use the testers that I did. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the, the make test zero one and try that. And now, oh, you know what I need to do? I need to compile my code, uh, which it should do that. Okay, let's clear this. Okay, let's see here. Ah, yeah. Okay, so I compiled my code after updating it. And now after compiling my code, I can go ahead and then make that that uh, first test case. And notice, so long after I make my changes, I want to always recompile. After recompiling, I get to say, yeah, I'm getting the same output as if I were to do an R test. In fact, if I wanted to do a comparison, a uh, cross comparison, I could do diff, if you remember. So here I can do diff, where I'm going to send the output from our test 01, send the output from test 01. And the only difference here should be, mm, oh, I got to do make, sorry. Make our test and make test. Perfect. We can see they're exactly the same except just these initial calls to our driver script, which is fine because one of our drivers, one of the scripts is touching our uh, TSH ref, our tiny shell reference, where it's, it's doing ours. And in fact, another way, if you might recall, is I actually can validate 
I can I can use the check tiny shell the tish dot pi. So let's let's take a look at that. And here, look at this. I got two points on trace one. So I and then now all of a sudden I'm not getting any points on anything else here. It's causing all sorts of chaos, 0, 0.0 points, and lots of errors and whatnot. But you could see I already initially saw I got the two points for that first one, which means I successfully, which means I can even do this if I wanted to. Let's load this into the uh, GDB. Let's do um, our tiny shell. We can just run our tiny shell. One nice thing about launching our tiny shells, if we messed it up, we can always just exit out without having to do anything inside of our actual uh, our outer shell, our terminal. So here we can try doing quit and we say, oh yeah, it, it quit like normal. It worked the way we want it. And now I can go ahead and uh, quit out of here. And we'll launch it. We can launch it this way too. I'll just launch it right from the command line until it quit. And we say, yeah, we quit out. It works exactly as our reference shell in that regards, right? Let's launch the reference shell, type in quit. And we can say, yeah, we got the same behavior. So that's trace one. So we just walked through trace one uh, and the very first lecture introducing this. And so we saw how we could test and evaluate the results of trace one using the diff. We saw how we can check to see how many points we've accumulated using the Python script. So the next thing we would do is move to trace two, which we will talk about next time. I've used up all my time for today to introduce this concept. But if I wanted to see what I had to do in trace two, just to motivate where we would go next, is I would cat trace2.txt. And then you could see the instructions that are going to be given to the test harness. Anyway, thank you for spending the time watching this lecture today. I will see you all next lecture. Have a great day and have a happy Halloween.